Welcome back. In the lecture today, we will do a different topic compared to the last few lectures where we proved renormalization in dimensional regularization. We take a step back and do a survey of different regularization and renormalization methods. And uh, the survey I will give here is basically um, based on this paper 2D or not 2D, which is a review uh, of many such schemes, and uh, I will follow basically um, that review. Um, in fact, in the last few years, quite a few interesting novel concepts and novel ideas have been developed and put forward in um, inventing new schemes, uh, and uh, many of them are quite promising, offer different pros and cons for practical calculations and also for fundamental considerations like proofs uh, of anomalies or other properties of quantum field theory. So it's quite nice to have at least an overview of which methods exist and what are their basic ideas. And so today I will not prove a lot, but I will provide you with the basic ideas of all these different methods uh, so that you can see the differences and maybe also the similarities. So um, to give you just an idea of what I plan to do, uh, I will first start with the BPHC formalism. This is actually not contained in this paper, but it's really the basis that everybody should know. Then I will discuss, of course, dimensional schemes, and there is ordinary dimensional regularization, which we have discussed all the time so far, but there is also a variant which is called dimensional reduction. You could either view it as a generalization or a special case depending on precisely how you look at it, but anyway we will discuss both, and each of them has several sub-variants which we can discuss. Then uh, we will discuss uh, purely four-dimensional schemes, which are different from BPHC, uh, the so-called implicit regularization. And the so-called FDR, or four-dimensional renormalization. And uh, then we will also discuss uh, what is called four-dimensional unsubtraction. FDU. And all of these schemes have uh, references and authors and inventors and uh, the, all the references you can find in complete uh, uh, in this review, and I will give some highlights of references later on in the course of this section, but I will not be complete, so please uh, go to that reference for a complete set of the basic references. Let us begin with the BPHC method. which we have already mentioned several times, and the names are Bogol, Yubov, Parasiuk, Hepp, and Zimmermann, uh, four different authors which um, successively established that scheme. So, what is, um, okay, maybe I should, maybe I should write it here. Okay, uh, so this is what we want to discuss. What is the basic idea? The basic idea is uh, the, first of all, it is based on the uh, R operation. That is, of course, uh, its basic starting point, the discovery that you can formulate renormalization as such a recursive problem, as we have discussed in our section two, as this R operation where you define the divergences of a diagram which has been sub-renormalized, which means all the divergences of sub-diagrams have already been subtracted. So this is a basic discovery that such a recursive operation is possible. And then the second discovery is that the divergence which remains after the sub-renormalization is local, which means it is a polynomial in the external momenta of a certain graph. And therefore, uh, now the really basic idea of how this is implemented in practice is to say that the divergence 
of a graph which is sub-renormalized is the Taylor polynomial in uh, its external momenta. So let me use this curly T as a, a Taylor operator. So in just using our notation from the previous section, we, uh, so we would have a momenta associated with a Feynman graph, let's say unambiguous uh, set of momenta of the Feynman graph, and then we do a Taylor expansion in these momenta to the order which corresponds to the degree of divergence of the graph. And then uh, this gives us the divergent part. And if you sub subtract uh, this divergent part from the diagram, then the remainder is finite. Which means that if you take a certain number of derivatives with respect to the external momenta, you annihilate the divergence because that is a polynomial of a certain degree. So this is a way to extract the divergences and this is um, behind the practical implementation of this BPHC. So uh, let me write this here. Then uh, what you do is you directly apply the R operation which uh, contains as a um, one ingredient the extraction and the subtraction of the divergences, and they are defined in this way. On to the integrand. And then one can show the finiteness of the result. Okay. This is the basic idea, and now I would just um, show you some highlights of the implementation of the BPHC formalism. Um, and uh, I already wrote that here. So these are the highlights of how this BPHC formalism is implemented. And uh, basically, I would say there are three highlights I want to stress here. After the original papers by Bogolyubov and Parasiuk, there was a paper by HEP, which gives the letter H here in the acronym. Then there was a paper by Zimmermann, which gives the Z. And then later there were some improvements, one can say, or uh, reformulations by Anikin, Polivanov, Zavialov, which we have already mentioned, and Berger and Zuber, which we also have already mentioned. So what are these three papers? In HEP's paper, he uses alpha parametrization in the same way as we did it in our section three and at the end of our section two. Actually, he doesn't use these labeled forests with T variables and betas, he just directly uses the alphas in a certain way. And uh, he does not yet have the forest formula, therefore he uses the original recursive formulation of the R operation, which was in our lecture section 2.1. And there, uh, the divergences are extracted only from the sub, completely sub-renormalized subgraphs. And uh, therefore, in order to implement this program, one needs an intermediate regularization. And uh, the, uh, so here, since this chapter is also about regularization methods, so here you see the extremely simple regularization that he uses, uh, namely, uh, you know that in alpha parametrization, the UV divergences come from alpha going to zero, and so he simply says uh, all the alpha integrals are carried out only up to some value r, where r is positive. That's all. And in this way, the integrals are regularized. Then he applies the r operation in this recursive way by um, uh, subtracting the divergences um, in the form of this Taylor operation acting on the momenta of the subgraphs. Then this gives an integral where still uh, all the alphas are only integrated up to R and where there is still uh, the curly epsilon from the I epsilon in the propagators. And then his theorem is that the limit of his integral where R going to zero and epsilon going to zero exists. So this is the basic theorem which proves that this BPHC formalism works and uh, yeah, 
Then the next step is the paper by Zimmermann. He does not use alpha space. He uses directly momentum space integrals where you have uh, Hesha grams like one over K plus P square minus N square plus I epsilon and so on. These integrals uh, are considered directly and in this paper the forest formula is invented and proven to be equivalent to the recursive R operation. And uh, then he again uses uh, the Taylor subtraction with respect to the external momenta to um, generate uh, the, the, um, yeah, uh, the subtractions. Um, but the difference now and uh, the big advantage which comes into play because of the forest formula is uh, that all of these Taylor operations can be directly applied onto the integrand you know that the forest formula basically gives a direct solution of um, the recursion operation, so you can apply all the subtractions directly to the integrand, and then uh, out of your original loop integral, you obtain another loop integral with a modified integrand. And uh, then here proves the theorem that this integrand can be integrated, so the integral is completely finite, and um, is of course the same uh, as the result here, um, but there is no intermediate regularization necessary. So one just uh, does this substitution rule onto the integrand, and then without any need for regularization, you can uh, get a finite renormalized result. And that is of course quite nice conceptually. It's not easy to apply in practical calculations, but conceptually, it's of course very clean because you do not need any modification of your four-dimensional space-time or any other regularization. However, it's not completely easy to do this because uh, one detail which he needs to take care of is um, to define very precisely and unambiguously what are really the internal and external momenta of the subgraphs uh, with respect to which you do the Taylor operation. Right? So if you say the subtraction of any graph is given by a Taylor operation uh, with respect to its external momenta, you need to define for any subgraph which is embedded in a much, much bigger graph what are its external momenta, and you need to do it in an unambiguous way in order to apply the forest formula really to the integrand. And there is, of course, not a unique choice and uh, you need to show, for instance, that the result is independent of the choice that you do and uh, that any choice gives to rise to a reasonable answer. So this is uh, one subtlety in this proof which makes it quite complicated. Then the next progress uh, was by these two papers and uh, they do uh, yeah, very similar approaches. Um, Namely, they use alpha parametrization like we did in uh, dimensional regularization, but plus the forest formula. So in some sense, they combine the best of both worlds of those two approaches. Therefore, they also do not need any regularization. They can directly write down the alpha integrals from zero to infinity over alpha, but they apply the Taylor subtraction onto the integrand. But the trick is now that instead of defining these external momenta of all the subgraphs, uh, like we did in our uh, dimensional regularization, the Taylor operation can be redefined to be a Taylor for, uh, subtraction for the T variables in all the subgraphs. So in the papers they don't call it T, but it really corresponds to our T variables. So each subgraph is, uh, the alphas in each subgraphs are uh, rescaled by a certain T, and then uh, the derivative with respect to all the momenta of that subgraph is equivalent to just one single uh, Taylor operation with respect to the T variable of that respective subgraph. So that is quite a nice simplification and it gets uh, somehow rid of this problem and it also gets rid of the need for regularization here. So uh, really this is kind of a simpler uh, approach, however, to the same problem. Just as a guide for you to read, I think all these three uh, papers or four papers are now quite well readable for you, but I would in particular uh, advise you to um, have a look 
at Zimmermann's paper and uh, on the paragraphs or subsections on the forest formula because uh, that goes really hand in hand with what we did here in the lecture. You will see a lot of similarities and uh, similar um, kind of lemmas and propositions and um, proofs of um, properties of the forest formula and the R operation using very similar ideas and methods as we have done here. Similarly here, in particular, the uh, second paper here by Berger and Zuber is very similar um, in its uh, details and uh, the equations that they uh, develop step by step to what we have done here in the context of dimension and regularization. So also in this paper you will find a lot of connections to uh, what we have done in the last few weeks here in the lecture. Okay, so this um, is the outline of the BPHC formalism. Let me write down a few more. Let me write down a few more um, pieces of information. So some properties. So what I would say is that this BPHC is the most basic um, and uh, completely general method. It can always be applied to any quantum field theory and to any Feynman diagram. Doesn't even need to come from a quantum field theory uh, uh, and uh, it generates a finite expression from any Feynman diagram. So all loop integrals become finite. And that includes uh, not only the usual so-called renormalizable quantum field theories, but also what uh, we often call non-renormalizable quantum field theories. We are, um, uh, this is the term I also use in the quantum field theory one lecture. So non-renormalizable here means that um, the Lagrangian contains terms or operators of dimension five or dimension six, where the coefficients in front of the operators go like one over mass or one over mass squared. And then uh, each order in perturbation theory needs um, additional counter terms which were not present in the order, um, in the previous order. Therefore, if you go to uh, infinitely high orders, such non-renormalizable QFTs need an infinite number of different counter term structures. And uh, then an uh, infinite number of counter term structures uh, corresponds to an infinite number of free parameters of the theory and in that sense the theory loses predictivity. However, as also explained in quantum field theory one, these uh, theories are very useful in practice because of this scaling. So the additional terms scale like one over mass or one over mass square, so they are suppressed. Therefore, if you are at low energies, uh, you can neglect the effects of those non-renormalizable operators and in that sense, the theory retains predictivity. In fact, uh, even better, you might say the theory predicts uh, what is precisely its range of validity in terms of energy scales. At low energies it's valid, at high energies it loses um, predictivity. So that these are non-renormalizable QFTs and they can be treated uh, in exactly the same way as the so-called renormalizable ones. Similarly, one can treat also um, composite operators So um, without explaining uh, this now much, but uh, usually uh, or so far in quantum field theory we discussed green functions of elementary fields, but you might also discuss green functions and expectation values of composite operators such as a field strength tensor or an energy momentum tensor and so on. And uh, uh, these green functions also lead to Feynman diagrams with different Feynman rules, um, but of course they also become finite in the same way. Then, 
we have this very important property of unitarity and causality. These properties are established and uh, the technical implementation of these properties and what they really mean, uh, for this I refer to the book by Bobol Lubov Shirkov. the quantum field theory textbook. We also uh, explained this in our quantum field theory one lecture, uh, but of course in this book, uh, all of this is explained extensively and from the correct point of view. Now, another uh, very important property of interest for all of us is the following disadvantage. Namely, this DPHC um, is not directly compatible with gauge invariance. which means the following. In, um, if you apply the BPHC and um, literally, and you generate your finite renormalized expression, then this finite renormalized expression does not, uh, or does not fulfill the relations corresponding to gauge invariance. However, um, this is not the end of the world because uh, the BPHC and any other formalism always allows you to, uh, after you have made something finite, you can still add finite local counterterms. That is always allowed and it is usually necessary to fulfill all kinds of desired renormalization conditions. And so here, however, the difficulty is that you absolutely need such finite additional counterterms in order to restore gauge invariance which was lost in this process. And so, of course, you have to um, not only adjust the finite counterterms to simple renormalization conditions, which are easy to fulfill, but you need to check uh, what do you need to do in order to fulfill relationships corresponding to gauge invariance, and that is much more difficult. And uh, just um, as an example, how you can see this in practice, I refer to a bachelor thesis where this was worked out in detail. Namely the bachelor thesis of Felix Reichenbach. From 2017, which you can download from our institute uh, webpage. And in this bachelor thesis, it was explicitly worked out um, um, what is the result of applying DPHC to QCD at the one loop level. And then you see that the QCD gauge invariance relations, so-called warden slavnov taylor identities, they are not valid after applying the R operation. So that is a big drawback and uh, one of the main reasons why you do not see this scheme applied very often in practice. Finally, let me add it here. Let me add it here. Uh, now let me try to add it here just as a small box, as an outlook. There is a similar um, in philosophy, a similar approach to renormalization to BPHC, uh, which is often called causal perturbation theory. And uh, sometimes it is just uh, called uh, with the names of the um, protagonists, Epstein Glaser. And the basic idea of this is to take to the extreme uh, also the same philosophy of BPAC, namely to put um, at the front the requirement of unitarity and causality of the S matrix in this uh, formulation of Gogol, Yubov, and Shirkov. Um, but then 
you see that uh, uh, first uh, is an, okay, the first step is the analysis. What is actually the problem behind the divergences? And of course we know that in momentum space we have divergent integrals, but uh, you might say the origin of all of this is that in position space you multiply distributions and the uh, multiplications of distributions um, is not allowed, at least not in general, mathematically. And so uh, the idea behind this approach is to take that uh, seriously and therefore to not go into momentum space at all, at least not in the beginning, but you stay in position space, in X space, and you say, I want unitarity and causality, and I want to solve the problem of multiplying distributions. Uh, so what are the distributions that are multiplied? So if you have a loop integral here, then what that means is that you have a product of two propagators, here one propagator going from x to y, and a second propagator going from x to y. Each propagator is a distribution which depends on x minus y, therefore you have multiplied two distributions with the argument x minus y. And that is mathematically not, uh, not permissible, at least not in general. And so you have here this product of distributions, and so you analyze very rigorously uh, to what extent is this product well-defined and to what extent is it not well-defined. And then you make it well-defined by uh, taking into account the requirements of unitarity and causality. And uh, the discovery is then that actually in such a case, as long as uh, the two arguments are different, the product of the two distributions is actually well-defined mathematically. But if the arguments become uh, equal, x equal y, so at one single point, then the product of the two distributions is not well-defined, and then you need to replace uh, this product by some well-defined distribution. And uh, loosely speaking, you might add or subtract certain delta functions or derivatives of delta functions, and you need to do it in such a way that in particular causality is um, conserved. And in this way, you construct mathematically, step by step, higher and higher loop diagrams in position space, which are based on well-defined mathematical distributions. And uh, the result of this operation is, of course, the same as what you obtain in BPHC, because also that um, fulfills these unitarity and causality requirements. But somehow, this is conceptually uh, even a cleaner approach. But it's even more difficult to apply in practice, and therefore it's uh, rarely used in practical calculations. Let me just uh, drop some names here. So um, uh, this is uh, still worked on also today, um, and uh, let me uh, write down some names. For example, Dutch and Friedenhagen. or shaft. Uh, these are authors from which you can find recent papers on this, where also the similarities and differences to dimensional regularization and BPHC are discussed. Okay, so, so far so good. Let us now continue with uh, the next method which is dimensional regularization and dimensional reduction. You already know the basic idea of dimensional regularization. Namely, we treat the integrals in d dimensions instead of four dimensions, and at the end of the day, we uh, let d uh, be a continuous variable and uh, take the limit d going to four. Then the divergences become one over d minus four poles. So, basically, x mu p mu and integrals over d 
decay, let's say, they all become d-dimensional. That is the basic idea of all dimensional schemes. Okay, now uh, there are some subtle differences between dimensional regularization and dimensional reduction. And just uh, in a, let's say, superficial level, um, the basic differences are as follows. Let me use this abbreviation for dimensional regularization here in this section. So in dimensional regularization, you say everything is continued to d dimensions, uh, where I mean everything which looks like a four vector becomes now a d dimensional vector. And so which other four vectors do we have in our quantum field theories? There are in, um, mainly two additional uh, four vector like objects. And these are the gamma matrices and uh, all kinds of vector fields like a mu, the photon field or the gluon field and so on. So all kinds of gauge fields in quantum field theories, they also have a Lorentz index. And of course you might have tensor fields as well. But anyway, these kinds of objects are also continued to the dimensions, which means here the Lorentz index mu is now um, corresponding to a d-dimensional space. And there might be some subtle details and um, differentiations, but that is the basic idea behind dimensional regularization. And now the difference in dimensional reduction is as follows. Namely, in dimensional reduction, you say that uh, only the momenta and um, space-time is continued to the dimensions. However, uh, other objects like these ones, they might not be. So, uh, but please note the quotation marks around four-dimensional um, because uh, what exactly is meant by four-dimensional um, is a big discussion and uh, we will um, outline what the discussion is about. But in particular, I need to say here that when people say dimensional reduction and also when it was invented, the key issue was that the four-dimensional space of those objects is a bigger space than the d-dimensional space of space-time, okay? That means these objects here have more components than uh, um, x mu and p mu. So let me say this, uh, what is called four-dimensional space in quotation marks is a bigger space than the d-dimensional space. And uh, d-dimensional space, let me just abbreviate it with ds for d-dimensional space, okay? I will explain you why that was important. It is important. Uh, and what is the reason behind assuming this? Because naively you could also assume the reverse. And we will come to that. Okay, but these are the basic ideas. So in dimensional regularization uh, on the whole, everything is just uniformly treated in d dimensions. In dimensional reduction, you uh, still keep some quantities in four dimensions, but you assume that the d-dimensional space is a subspace of the four-dimensional space and therefore the name uh, dimensional reduction. Let me now, before explaining those uh, subtle details, uh, just um, give the basic definitions of these uh, objects here. There are essentially two distinct ways of looking at defining dimensional regularization. And uh, the two kinds of approaches can be represented by the paper by Breitenlohner Meison. So they did not invent the scheme. The scheme was invented by uh, several groups, Toft Feldman, 
Pauline Trump Biagi and uh, other groups. Um, and uh, also they, of course, uh, gave some definitions, but uh, in this paper here, uh, you can see a very clean approach to how they define dimensional regularization. That's why I mentioned this paper. And as I said, you can see uh, many more references in the review. And uh, the alternative uh, way to think about defining dimensional regularization is in the Collins book. Uh, which is also based on a paper by Wilson from 73. So let me contrast these two approaches and the two ways of looking at how you can define these things. So in the paper by Breitlund and Meisson, of course they need a definition of d-dimensional loop integrals. How can you define a d-dimensional integral where d is not an integer? And you saw in our lecture how uh, they did it and how we did it, namely, we first go to alpha space. And you can do that in integer dimensions. And then you see that the resulting formula for loop integrals in alpha space depend on the dimensionality only in a very, very simple form. Namely, the semantic polynomial uh, appears to the power minus d over 2. That's all. That is the single appearance of the dimensionality. Therefore, at this point, uh, you can say the definition of d-dimensional integrals where d is arbitrary is simply take the alpha representation and uh, simply allow that this exponent minus d over 2 is now an arbitrary number. That's all. So then we have this d tilde to the minus d over 2. And now you see. And you derive, of course, this alpha formulation, let's say, first for integer dimensions, but then you allow d equal 4 minus 2 epsilon, where epsilon is arbitrary. And then, uh, as we saw, you get poles in epsilon, where epsilon goes to 0. Now, um, this is fine. However, a drawback is that you have now defined d-dimensional integrals only for specific integrands, namely, for the loop integrands for which you can do the alpha representation. Those integrals are now defined in d-dimensions, but any other integral is not defined in d-dimensions, so this is a drawback. Of course, you can imagine that you can derive an alpha formulation for generalized integrants, so we do not absolutely have to restrict ourselves to those loop integrals where we have all these usual forms of propagators. You might generalize the forms of propagators somewhat and still derive such a formulation and then also this kind of definition works. But still, um, it works not for any function but for a specific uh, set of functions. Then. Uh, because of this here, you need objects in the dimensions. You need objects like, for example, gamma mu in d dimensions. And let me just denote it here with a bracket d. So this denotes a gamma matrix in d dimensions, where d dimensions refers to the Lorentz index, which now corresponds to d dimensions. Similarly, metric tensors of this d dimensional space must exist, and so on. And uh, what is simply done in this paper is to say that these are formal objects which are defined by their algebraic properties, which one can write down uh, as a list of equations, like axioms, and then one can compute with those formal objects by using those um, axiomatically defined properties. Okay, that is nice. But now, um, let me contrast this with the other approach, which has certain advantages, and uh, they were clearly pointed out also in, in the book. Namely, if you do that, uh, you can write down any sort of uh, equations that you postulate as axioms in some sense, but how do you know 
that those equations are internally consistent, in other words, um, that they do not contradict each other. And the best way to prove that such uh, equations that you just invent on a formal level, that they are consistent is that you give a mathematical uh, existence proof that you can write down a well-defined mathematical object which does have these properties and then you know that all the equations are of course fulfilled because your uh, established object has those properties and then you can really go on and you know that all calculations that you do in this approach are um, internally consistent and will never lead to any contradiction. So uh, therefore the idea is here to really write down explicit mathematical definitions of all objects which are required. And so the nice thing is that this is actually possible. And, uh, as I said, this uh, would prove that there are no inconsistencies. Such as that uh, somebody evaluates uh, an equ expression using some uh, formal relationships and gets one result and somebody else uh, starts from the same initial expression but uses different intermediate steps and arrives at a different result so you can prove something like one equals zero. And that is not possible if uh, you prove such an explicit construction. So that would be very good. And so here, the three-dimensional space in quotation marks again, is now constructed as a vector space. And uh, the basic uh, idea is that, of course, there is no vector space with a non-integer number of dimensions. Um, but what you want is some mathematical space which exists and which has properties which resemble a uh, d-dimensional space. Uh, so on which you can define objects which have the desired algebraic properties. And the way to do it is to realize this as an infinite dimensional vector space. So this uh, in quotation marks d-dimensional space really is defined as an infinite dimensional vector space. On which uh, we define objects which have the desired properties. That is a key insight that, uh, first of all, you need infinitely many dimensions, and uh, second, that it is actually possible. Let me immediately write down a conclusion from this. A conclusion is that the actual four-dimensional space can never be a subspace of the d-dimensional space. Uh, so the, let's say, actual four-dimensional space cannot be, uh, sorry, cannot be a superspace So this is a corollary of this insight. And uh, this is important because of that remark here on dimensional reduction. Remember in dimensional reduction we said that we want to keep some objects in four dimensions, but the four dimensional space should be bigger than the d-dimensional space. Now here you see, if you want a mathematically consistent definition of your d-dimensional space, then you need actually infinitely many dimensions. Therefore, uh, this is not possible unless you put here the quotation marks. And then you need to think again uh, what you actually mean when you say some objects remain in four dimensions, and that we will discuss later. But for now, uh, this is a key insight. We need infinitely many dimensions. And then, for example, you can represent a d-dimensional uh, momentum vector with infinitely many components. So you would have P0, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, and so on. Infinitely many components. And uh, the first four are, of course, the physical part. 
but all the rest uh, might be non-zero in the course of regularization. Then with this idea, you can define a d-dimensional integral. First of all, you consider also a certain space of functions, which is, however, more general than this one. You consider space of functions, first of all, scalar functions, which depend only on scalar products. Let's say p square, p dot q, q square, and so on, all kinds of scalar products. So if you have such functions, then uh, all of, for all of those functions, one will be able to define a d-dimensional integration. And then one can uh, even be more general and consider tensor functions, where you also have open Lorentz indices, for example, p mu, q mu times f1 uh, uh, with such arguments plus q mu, p mu, f2 with uh, such arguments, plus g mu nu, f3 with such arguments, and so on. So this is an example, but uh, you can have arbitrarily complicated prefactors here with open Lorentz indices times some functions which depend on scalar products. And in this way, you have a very general class of functions, which uh, contains, of course, the loop integrals. And uh, all for all of these functions, one can define an integral. Now, how is the integral defined? The integral is defined constructively so one can construct a d-dimensional integration of all these functions by specifying how uh, one integrates over uh, all these infinitely many components of the loop momentum. And uh, for the precise definition, you can look into the book. And uh, then one can establish properties of this integral. So and the properties are uh, very simple. Namely, you have linearity as you have for all integrals, so an integral over k of f plus g is the same as the integral of f plus the integral of g, and of course the same holds also for prefactors. Then you have scaling, integral over k of f of, let's say, s times k, where s is a real number, then uh, you can uh, put this out of the integral by transforming the integration measure, and then you get s to the minus d of the integral just of uh, f of k. And so here, this scaling property defines the d-dimensionality of the integral. This is really the thing which makes it d-dimensional. And the point is that uh, such an integral can be defined on the space of functions which depend on scalar products of such infinitely dimensional vectors. So, then we have translational invariance, which means if you have uh, f plus k, so you shift your integration momentum, then you can transform the measure by k going to k minus p, and the integral remains the same. This holds for all d-dimensional integrals, right? So in four dimensions or in one dimension, for ordinary integral, this is not always fulfilled. But uh, here it's always fulfilled for this integral over the full d-dimensional space when d is um, an arbitrary number. So this is very important also for practical calculations because uh, being able to do this in calculations dramatically simplifies your calculations. And similarly, uh, so Collins proves many more properties and let me just write down one if other highlight of those properties, so you can uh, take a derivative outside of the integral, and uh, the derivative commutes with the integral. So 
So this is also extremely important for practical calculations. So all of those properties mean that you can now um, forget about the constructive definition of the integral. You can just use those integration rules, which mean that the integration really behaves like a normal integral, first of all, uh, but the space behaves in a d-dimensional way. So all of this can be established. Then the next thing is to define uh, those algebraic objects, and they can also be defined constructively, so a metric tensor in formally d dimensions. So this is, of course, a tensor which uh, is defined on this really infinite dimensional space. So this, uh, in the sense of mu nu, this is a matrix with infinitely many components. However, it is defined in such a way that it has d-dimensional properties, namely if you contract two of them with upper and lower indices, then the result is d and not infinity. Okay, and uh, so you can again construct such tensors or bilinear forms on this space, linear mappings if you want, or bilinear mappings on this infinite dimensional space which have these properties, and uh, that is possible. And that is actually defined via the d-dimensional integral. So in some sense, because you already know that the uh, integral has d-dimensional properties, you can define uh, this g mu with upper and lower indices by making use of the integral, and then you get this d-dimensional property. Now, again, a key, um, let's say, Tricky insight is the following, namely the d-dimensional space and the original four-dimensional space, they are related uh, obviously as such that the original four-dimensional space is a subspace of the d-dimensional space. There is no other way. And so uh, you can define it such that the metric tensors act like projection operators on those respective spaces. So if you have here a metric tensor for the d-dimensional space, and you contract one index with a metric tensor for the four-dimensional space, then this is the smaller space, and this acts like a projection operator on it. Therefore, what you get here is the four-dimensional metric tensor with the remaining indices. So d times four gives a four-dimensional space. And here the four, really means the original fundamental four-dimensional space-time with strictly four dimensions. Then you can, again, I say it like this. Uh, the, how should I say it? In which order? Let's say the four-dimensional strict actual four-dimensional space is a subspace which is not equal to the d-dimensional space. This is an important detail, and there is no other way. Now, gamma matrices. Gamma matrices are also constructed. And you know, uh, now here the Lorentz index mu corresponds to this uh, infinite dimensional space. So mu runs from zero to infinity, but again with d-dimensional properties. But then for each mu, that must be a matrix as well. And so for each mu, this is again an infinite dimensional matrix. And you can construct explicitly such infinitely many infinite dimensional matrices with those commutation rules. Okay, so this can be, you can explicitly write down such matrices which satisfy that. And uh, then here you have this uh, d-dimensional metric tensor from here. And here you would have the unit matrix in the space of this um, spin or space 
which is now infinite dimensional. And you can also construct it in such a way that the trace of this uh, unit matrix, even though it's now infinite dimensional, is four. By giving also a constructive definition of the trace operation. So all of this can be done. And what this means is that we can give a constructive recipe of all the algebraic objects in dimensional regularization and also in dimensional reduction. Therefore, all these algebraic relationships can be uh, mathematically fulfilled in an internally consistent way, which cannot lead to any contradictions later on. If two people calculate the same quantity in different ways, they will never end up with conflicting answers. This is very important. And so this is completely established, and you can see the details in the book. Now, uh, let us... Let us go on. Okay, let us go on with the definition of dimensional reduction. Dimensional reduction was invented by Siegel in 1979. And what I say here refers to a consistent version of dimensional reduction, which is based on the ideas that we have just described for dimensional regularization. So just as a, a preliminary remark, in the history of that scheme, um, a lot of papers were written on possible inconsistencies and mathematical problems and internal problems and um, inconsistent results or um, surprising results uh, which people couldn't really interpret. And basically, all these um, problems can be resolved by resorting to this, uh, what I will now call consistent version of dimensional reduction. Um, and uh, I will just explain what that is, and afterwards, in some comments, you uh, get an indication of what went wrong uh, previously by uh, not considering some of the uh, details which I now present. So the consistent version of dimensional reduction, um, first of all, is based on this uh, desire that we want uh, to keep the gauge fields and gamma matrices in four dimensions. But the four-dimensional space should be bigger than the d-dimensional space. So we have here, let's call it the d-dimensional space, and I put it again in quotation marks because it's really uh, an infinite-dimensional space with d-dimensional properties. And we already said that uh, the original four-dimensional space must be a subspace. So this is the actual four-dimensional space, and uh, since that is infinite dimensional, uh, that is the only relationship that can work. Now, that scheme wants uh, the gauge fields in four dimensions, but uh, that should be a bigger space than the d-dimensional space. That means, in order to make it consistent, we need to introduce a quasi four-dimensional space quasi four-dimensional space or four-dimensional space in quotation marks. And that is constructed in the identical way as the d-dimensional space. It is a formal space or an infinite dimensional space with four-dimensional properties. So whenever in the previous equations we had uh, d appearing, then uh, there would now be a four. And so this is really infinite dimensional. And that is an even bigger space, but also infinite dimensional. And because of that, you must not identify that space with the actual four-dimensional space. And this resolves uh, most inconsistencies. And for now, and also in the 2D or not 2D paper, uh, we highlight this difference by writing uh, this as a DS dimensional, where DS is a variable but we always think of ds being equal to four, and then we would have those spaces, the actual four-dimensional space, a quasi d-dimensional space, and a ds-dimensional space, which is, uh, behaves like four-dimensional, but is also uh, such a quasi space. And then you can also write this as a direct sum of the d-dimensional space plus, um, uh, let's say, ds minus d dimensional space. 
So it's an orthogonal sum, two infinite dimensional spaces, one with d dimensional properties, one with ds minus d dimensional properties, and together they give uh, an even bigger space which uh, behaves like a ds dimensional space. Okay, so this is the sequence of spaces that one needs to treat the scheme consistently. And this is reflected now in metric tensors. You have a G4 mu nu for the actual four dimensional space. You will have a GD mu nu for the D dimensional space where the integrals are defined and momenta in space time. And you have a DS dimensional metric tensor where we think of DS equal to four but they satisfy now these projection relations. So if you contract the four-dimensional with the d-dimensional one, then this is the smaller space. It's contained in that one. Therefore, if you do this, then you obtain a four-dimensional metric tensor. Okay. On the other hand, this is a bigger space than that one. Therefore, if you multiply those two projectors, then uh, you obtain a d-dimensional one. And these sets of relations define the sequence of sp uh, uh, spaces in an algebraic way. Then in concrete calculations, uh, sometimes it is also useful to split the d-dimensional tensor into a sum, which corresponds to this direct sum of spaces g mu nu d-dimensional plus a remainder g mu nu for the remaining space, which would then be, let's say, a, a two epsilon dimensional space or a ds minus d-dimensional space. And then you, these are orthogonal spaces. So if you put contract these two, then you get zero and so on. So you have all these kinds of relationships. Similarly, you have also gamma matrices. Gamma matrices in this ds dimensional space. And uh, just um, as a basic remark, all these objects are defined constructively like in dimensional regularization. And therefore, we are sure that there are no internal inconsistencies. And will the gamma matrices, for instance, satisfy in this computation relation? and so on. Now, um, as I said, I want to give a lot of comments on why we need all these properties and why we want those different properties, which might sound, um, let's say, unmotivated. But I first wanted to give you all the definitions and then uh, explain all the reasons for everything. But uh, before going to the um, more detailed comments, let me just give you one indication what happens now if you have a gauge theory. In a gauge theory, the central object is the covariant derivative. It contains the gauge field and the ordinary derivative and uh, the gauge field and the ordinary derivative have to act together to make uh, kinetic terms covariant gauge invariant, and uh, so this covariant derivative in a regularized theory now would look like this, a d-dimensional derivative for the d-dimensional space-time plus i times gauge coupling times a gauge field. And now you can ask, uh, what is the, the dimensionality of this gauge field, the Lorentz index? four-dimensional, d-dimensional, or ds-dimensional. And the point is 
that in dimensional reduction, we want this to be ds dimensional, where ds is the bigger space than the d dimensional space. And then you can decompose it if you want into this. A d dimensional part plus the ds minus d dimensional part. So these are orthogonal spaces as we discussed. So, but uh, this at least contains the full d-dimensional space. Now, why is this important? It is important because those two together form now a fully d-dimensional covariant derivative. And such an existence of a d-dimensional covariant derivative means that you can have d-dimensional gauge invariants. So, gauge invariants under, uh, let's say, d to the i alpha of x, where this x is now a d-dimensional coordinate, and um, let's say you transform your spinos uh, in this way. In d dimensions, and the Lagrangian in d dimensions is gauge invariant. In order to make it gauge invariant, you of course need a d-dimensional gauge field in order to compensate uh, the uh, inhomogeneous terms coming from the derivative of this alpha in d dimensions, okay? So in order to have a d-dimensional gauge invariant theory, for sure, uh, there must be as many gauge field dimensions as you have space-time dimensions. Otherwise, gauge invariance is lost in the d-dimensional space. And uh, first of all, that is a reason in dimensional regularization why the gauge field should not be kept in four dimensions but should also be d-dimensional. Second, in dimensional reduction, uh, it's the reason why we want uh, the four-dimensional space for the gauge field to be a bigger space than the d-dimensional space. So this is a, a d-dimensional covariant derivative. And now in dimensional reduction, so therefore, uh, if you have this property that the uh, four-dimensional space where the gauge fields live is bigger than the d-dimensional one, then that is working. You have this d-dimensional covariant derivative, but you have these extra terms, extra terms in, the, in uh, this d mu, which you actually don't need to uh, have d-dimensional gauge invariance. So these are extra. And these extra terms are there because you said in the beginning we want the, to keep the gauge fields in four dimensions, and therefore now we have this mismatch between the number of gauge field components and the number of components you actually need uh, for the dimensional gauge invariance. But that is the reason uh, why you have this relationship between the quasi four dimensional and the d dimensional space in dimensional reduction. Let me now come to uh, the announced comments and explanations. So first in dimensional regularization, as we just discussed, uh, the four-dimensional space is always a subspace. Of our d-dimensional space, because that must really be infinite dimensional. And so let me now answer this question. Why uh, do we want the gauge field to be in d-dimensions? Why is it not sufficient to keep the gauge field in four dimensions? So, and the answer is what I just gave you. Then the d-dimensional Lagrangian contains d mu, which is now given as the d-dimensional derivative plus the d-dimensional gauge field. And you have d-dimensional gauge invariance.
And this is very nice to have. It, this is one of the key features uh, which makes dimensional regularization so useful that you can uh, set it up in such a way that you have the dimensional gauge invariance. Then, um, more or less, gauge invariance is kept completely manifest at all intermediate steps of every calculation. Up to some details which I mention later. Okay, but that is the basic reason. So if you would uh, keep the gauge field in strictly four dimensions, which has fewer components than the d-dimensional space, that is possible, and the brighton lohner meison proof would also be valid for that choice. But then, of course, gauge invariance is lost at intermediate steps, like in BPHC. Okay, so that is one reason, and the uh, um, outcome of this is that if you have the gauge field propagator, then the gauge field propagator in d dimensions uh, has this form minus i times a d-dimensional metric tensor divided by p square plus i epsilon. And uh, so this d-dimensionality of the metric tensor is uh, then a feature of, of the Feynman rules in dimensional regularization. Okay. Second question, why do we want the gamma matrices to be d-dimensional? So again, the brighton lohner meison proof uh, was kind of blind to that choice, and that means that we could also keep the gamma matrices in strictly four dimensions, which is a subspace of that, but uh, that would have the following disadvantage. Have a look at the fermion propagator. The fermion propagator in D dimensions uh, is now P slash plus M divided by P square minus M square plus I epsilon. And now everything is now d-dimensional. That means we have here a d-dimensional p slash from a d-dimensional momentum contracted with d-dimensional gamma matrices. And here we have a d-dimensional p square. And if that is uh, written like this, then uh, using the normal um, calculation, you show that this is the inverse of p slash in d-dimensions minus n. So that is an equality. If you have d-dimensional gamma matrices satisfying the Clifford algebra, uh, then um, let's say the inverse of p slash minus m is that expression. A simple proof, identical to four dimensions. However, if you would not um, continue your gamma matrices to d-dimensions, but you would keep them in four dimensions, then you might have here a four-dimensional, okay, then First of all, if you write here 4 and here a 4, then that is not the inverse of that. It would be the inverse if you put a 4 also here into the denominator. But if you put a 4 into the denominator here, then you have not regularized your propagator. Then your loop integration is over four-dimensional momenta, uh, which means you have no regularization. So that uh, doesn't work. So you must. Um, regularize your theory by having at least here in the denominator a d, which means you integrate over d-dimensional momenta. And the denominators depend on the d-dimensional momenta. That uh, was used in our proof. But then if you put a 4 here, then that is not the inverse of that. That is very bad, or it has at least a, a significant disadvantage. Uh, but let me say it in a positive way, so uh, if we write it like this, then this has an advantage. It is directly connected to a d-dimensional Lagrangian. Okay, so if you write down a d-dimensional Lagrangian, where you have here a d-dimensional d slash, then by applying the usual derivation of Feynman rules, this gives rise to this propagator, uh, which is the same as that one, and therefore you have a complete connection 
between a regularized Lagrangian and the regularized Feynman rules. This was not something we required in our proof of convergence, but it's really nice to have such a property as we will discuss later in the lecture, next week or next to next week. So such a connection to a Lagrangian on the regularized level is a really useful feature and that is one reason why we like to have that. So again, this might not be strictly necessary, uh, but if you uh, do it differently, then your regularization scheme has worse properties. So let me uh, say also another property. So often, or at least sometimes, it is useful to use a split gamma mu or other objects in D dimensions, you can write it as gamma mu in strictly four dimensions plus the remainder gamma mu, which would then be uh, in minus two epsilon dimensions. So you can of course uh, write down such a split by using metric tensors as projection operators onto those respective subspaces. No problem, it's an identity. And sometimes it's useful to uh, set up your calculation by using those individual objects instead of the combined object. And then this object is of course something which vanishes in strictly four dimensions. So this will be set to zero at the very, very end after doing all the renormalization procedure. And uh, we gave it a name, so this is a so-called evanescent object, which uh, will be set to zero at the end, but uh, which must be kept in intermediate steps. So this is another remark. Now, Dimensional reduction. So, uh, why do we want a mu in a quasi four dimensional space? Which is bigger? Yeah, the quasi four dimensional space should be a bigger space so bigger space than the three dimensional space. Why do we want that? And the answer is the covariant derivative. Then we have a full three dimensional gauge invariance. But we also have some extra terms corresponding to this A mu field in this T S minus D dimensional space, which uh, would also be evanescent objects. Uh, but this is a secondary. The primary reason is uh, we want uh, this relationship between the spaces to have full d-dimensional gauge invariance. That is a byproduct, which is not the main point. But that is the main point, and now we see, in order to avoid mathematical inconsistencies, we must not identify the space of the gauge fields with the actual four-dimensional space. Let me abbreviate it with Q4S, the quasi four dimensional space, uh, or uh, this TS dimensional space with the actual four dimensional space. If anybody would uh, identify the two spaces, then at some point you will run into contradictions and zero equal one and so something like this. 
Now, the other question, why should we use that scheme at all? It seems more complicated than dimensional regularization. Um, why at all gamma mu and a mu in four dimensions in quotation marks? Why this desire? And the reason for the, uh, this desire is in particular supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is tied to strictly four dimensions. Therefore, uh, it requires, for example, equal number of degrees of freedom in the vector field, a mu, and the superpartner, the so-called Gagino. The Gagino is a spin one-half particle, and it's described by a Gagino spinor, like the electron spinor or the neutrino spinor. Uh, it's actually a Majorana spinor, but anyway, uh, such a spinor in four dimensions has four components, and the vector field in four dimensions also has four components, so the number of components is the same. And uh, the degrees of freedom of the corresponding particles are also the same. And that is a requirement of supersymmetry, this symmetry between fermions and bosons. And uh, now if you regularize the theory, then the spinors uh, effectively uh, remain four-dimensional, which you can see in this trace of the unit matrix is still four. So therefore, you would want that on the regularized level also the gauge fields are four-dimensional and then supersymmetry is also preserved on the regularized level. So here we have now discussed gauge invariance and uh, that requires the gauge fields to be at least d-dimensional. Then we can preserve gauge invariance, but here we would require the gauge fields and associated objects to remain four-dimensional. And that was the key idea why this scheme was invented, in order to have a scheme which is directly compatible with supersymmetry. And so um, the original dimensional regularization breaks supersymmetry on the regularized level, which means that once you calculate one loop diagrams uh, involving um, photons and photinos, then uh, the result of those diagrams do not reflect the supersymmetry anymore and um, you need to take this into account in your renormalization procedure. So that is a drawback and uh, the scheme was invented to get rid of this drawback. So now and then historically, um, not all of what I said here today was clarified immediately and therefore um, some calculations were done kind of under the assumption that you might identify the quasi four-dimensional space of the gauge fields with the actual four-dimensional space. Some simplifications were done and then inconsistencies arose. So this can now be cleanly avoided by going to these three spaces at the top here. So actual four-dimensional space, d-dimensional space, and quasi four-dimensional space. All of that is necessary in order to set up the scheme, but then uh, you have those two advantages, namely at first sight, the dimensional re reduction is well compatible with supersymmetry and well compatible with gauge invariance. But as I already said, there are some subtleties, but nevertheless, this is the overall picture. What does it mean that you are not able to identify the quasi four-dimensional space with the actual four-dimensional space? What is the key difference between these two spaces? Let me write that also down. The key difference is that in the actual four-dimensional space, you know, it has four dimensions, it's a vector space, so you have a basis, and the basis has precisely four elements, um, so you know that any vector in the space can be uh, written as a linear combination of precisely four basis elements. 
And that is the thing which is not possible here. So in other words, I like to say uh, index counting is not possible. Every relation which relies on uh, the fact that uh, the indices can take precisely four values, 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, those relations are valid here, but not valid over there. So index counting is possible. And here it's not possible. And this has many consequences. For example, um, you know that also the gamma matrices, uh, gamma mu is a four by four matrix. And uh, so the space of uh, all matrices that you can construct out of gamma matrices, gamma mu, gamma mu, gamma mu, gamma mu, gamma sigma, whatever you do, you always end up with a four by four matrix. And there are 16 linearly independent four by four matrices. So whatever you do, uh, multiplying as many gamma matrices as you want, you can always represent the result as a linear combination of 16 different uh, gamma objects. And that is also not possible here. So gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma rho, gamma sigma, and so on, can be written as a linear combination of uh, basis matrices. And uh, that is not possible here. And so this is at the heart of what is called fields identities. So they are valid in strictly four dimensions, but they are invalid in uh, these quasi four dimensions. And everything else, every relationship where you need to know that the indices can take up to four different values uh, are invalid. So also this, I mean, if you have P mu, P mu, P rho, P sigma, P alpha, so you have a product of five uh, objects with five different Lorentz indices. If you are strictly in four dimensions, you know for sure at least two of the indices are equal. But in this quasi four dimensional space, that is not the case. So uh, you can have five different values of these indices. So these are differences, and uh, if your calculation makes use of such an argument, then it uh, is only valid in actually four dimensions, but not in this quasi four dimensional space. And so you can guess that uh, such relationships are rare. You don't need this very often in calculations, but sometimes you do, and anyway, that is the difference. Good. So let me give some brief comments on variance. Um, you do not have to do it in the way I just indicated. You can also do it differently. You can, for example, regularize in a way such that the connection to the Lagrangian is lost or such that you break gauge invariance in d dimensions and you keep only a strictly four dimensional gauge field, like a mu in strictly four dimensions, um, but they are rarely used in practice. One reference where something like this is used is in a paper by Anselmi, where he argues that uh, um, having a d-dimensional gauge field um, is not as advantageous uh, as one might think because of the gamma-5 problem which we discussed below. But anyway, in uh, practically all other applications of the schemes, it is done in the way I indicate. Now let me write down some properties just such that you are familiar with, with what are the uh, interesting um, advantages of the schemes. So in these consistent versions of the schemes, uh, there is a theorem valid, namely the so-called quantum action principle.
and we will discuss this in the lecture in uh, either one or two weeks from now. And uh, this is an important theorem which is the basis of establishing um, gauge invariance at the full level on the level of green functions after renormalization. So what I did uh, so far was an argument that you have a connection to a Lagrangian to the dimensional covariant derivative, but that is not a proof that the renormalized and regularized green functions are fully in agreement with gauge invariance, but in order to uh, prove that, uh, the quantum action principle is extremely useful together with the properties that we have mentioned before. So this is a theorem. And uh, then in QED and QCD, all of the schemes that I have presented, dimensional regularization and dimensional reduction, um, are indeed gauge invariant. So uh, using that theorem, you can fully establish that uh, gauge invariance holds. Let me say gauge invariance is manifest. That means it holds at all levels of the calculation in all intermediate steps. Gauge invariance is uh, manifest before and after renormalization. And uh, you should know that gauge invariance is um, in quotation marks because uh, it, what is really valid are so-called slashnov taylor and Ward identities. which represent gauge invariance on the level of green functions. Then uh, it is equivalent to BPHC and uh, therefore also in agreement with unitarity and causality. And uh, that is a remark without explicit proof in the paper by Brighton, Luna, Meisson, and it is explicitly discussed in a paper by Speer from 1974. Also, dimensional reduction and dimensional regularization are equivalent in the same sense, and this is proven in a paper by Jack Jones and Roberts. From 93. And in particular, uh, yeah, uh, this paper uh, makes use of this consistent version of dimensional reduction, where this is really valid. And this paper also uh, clarifies some details, uh, what you need to make sure if you want to establish that equivalence. So, uh, this is the next point. All these statements require what I already remarked last time, namely, these everness and objects which appear they must be uh, treated completely in the course of renormalization and you must not set evanescent objects to zero too early. In other words, you must not set them to zero at all unless you are done with everything and everything is finite. Uh, only then you can set them to zero. Now there are two kinds of evanescent objects, both in dimensional regularization and in dimensional reduction. Uh, there are uh, evanescent objects in dimensional regularization. You have, of course, these objects, let me denote it by the metric tensor um, of um, D minus four. So the d-dimensional space is a bigger space than the actual four-dimensional space. And so you can say uh, there is an orthogonal minus uh, two epsilon dimensional space. Uh, 
which um, uh, is the complement of the four-dimensional space to give the full d-dimensional space. And then objects involving just this minus two epsilon dimensional uh, space, they must be kept, they must be uh, renormalized, and if they appear uh, in isolation, then you must nevertheless not throw them away. That was part of the proof of renormalization in dimensional regularization, and we remarked it. So these objects exist, and uh, in dimensional reduction, those objects also exist, uh, but there are additional objects, namely there are those objects coming from the ds minus d dimensional space. Those are also evanescent, and uh, they also must be kept in the same sense. And for example, in this equivalence proof between the two schemes, uh, that was very important. And in the literature, again, um, that is why I said before, many inconsistencies, many surprising results. Sometimes this was ignored, and then uh, people did not find that dimensional reduction uh, was unitary. So unitarity was broken or destroyed by the dimensional reduction, and then, of course, it could also not be equivalent to dimensional regularization. And the resolution of this paradox is uh, that they failed to take into account uh, the renormalization of those evanescent objects. So that is necessary. It's uh, maybe tedious, but it's necessary. Then just maybe to give you an indication what it actually means, it means that if you write down a counterterm Lagrangian for your theory, that counterterm Lagrangian might contain objects like, for example, renormalization constant delta z times psi bar times uh, i gamma mu in minus two epsilon dimensions times b mu times psi. This is just a counterterm which only contains such an evanescent object. That might be necessary. And the Feynman rule corresponding to this would be a Feynman rule for a counterterm vertex for psi psi bar. And the Feynman rule for this counterterm vertex would now be delta z times p slash and uh, the minus two epsilon dimensional part of the p slash. Such a counterterm might be necessary to cancel some divergence because maybe some one over epsilon divergence uh, is just multiplied with this object. And then you need this counterterm to cancel the one over epsilon divergence in our python lunar meson proof. And that would correspond to such a Lagrangian. And if you fail to put this in, then uh, all of these statements here become incorrect. And the same is true for dimensional reduction, as I said. So then you would have maybe objects where you have this ds minus d dimensional gamma matrix and so on. So all of that really appears. Now, uh, a completely different remark. There are not only UV divergences, but also infrared divergences. And we can treat infrared divergences as well. These infrared divergences are not the focus of the present lecture, but let me just say they arise only if there are massless particles, and then they arise uh, typically for special kinematic situations. For example, if you have p square equal m square for certain particles, um, and uh, then they arise from loops of massless particles, but the infrared divergences uh, are not cancelled by renormalization. They just remain. They, as I said, correspond to isolated kinematic uh, points or uh, hypersurfaces. And they are cancelled by um, identifying correct observables. If you have infrared divergences, then um, such an S-matrix element uh, with massless particles is not an observable quantity, neither theoretically if you characterize observables, nor experimentally. And so you have to calculate something that is really observable, and then you have to add to your S-matrix element here some other S-matrix elements where you emit a real radiation. Uh, let me just indicate this with a single Feynman diagram. So 
So this is a Feynman diagram. Let's imagine QED. Then uh, you see here uh, this radiation of an additional massless photon in the final state. And such a radiation of a massless photon in the final state, um, if the massless photon is, um, has very small energy, then experimentally you cannot distinguish it just from this electron uh, alone. And even theoretically, if you would like to define rigorously an observable quantity, then you would see um, that uh, you cannot, um, in theory, distinguish um, or have an isolated observable for this process with one electron alone. You must combine it uh, with the case where the electron is accompanied with a low energy photon. And so in the calculation, it happens that the integral over the phase space momentum of these uh, photons here is divergent, infradivergent. And this infradivergent from such phase space integrals cancels the infradivergence coming from loop integrals like this one here. So if you uh, really um, identify correct observable quantities and calculate them, then the infradivergences cancel automatically without um, having to do renormalization and counter terms and so on. Nevertheless, they appear, and in dimensional regularization or reduction, they can also uh, appear in the form of one over epsilon poles. So, and then you can uh, distinguish here several items, several kinds of photons, and let's start here. This photon here is a photon which is, um, let's say, a three-level photon, an internal three-level photon. It has some fixed momentum, which is defined by the initial state, and this uh, fixed momentum is um, off-shell, so p square is not equal to m square, and it's a fixed momentum. It's not integrated over at all. Therefore, there are no divergences whatever associated with this photon. no divergences at all associated with this photon. On the other hand, and uh, we would call this a regular photon. On the other hand, here you have a loop, a one-loop diagram. Let's say this could be an electron loop. This is, of course, UV divergent. And the UV divergence is cancelled by counterterms and by renormalization. Here you have also a loop, and uh, this loop is also UV divergence, and uh, the UV divergence is cancelled by renormalization. However, if that is a massless photon, then this loop can also be infrared divergent. And uh, you can treat the additional infrared divergence also in dimensional regularization, and then this would give additional 1 over epsilon poles, and sometimes even 1 over epsilon square poles, even though it's only one loop. So the infrared divergences behave differently in this respect. And here, this is also, uh, this is uh, not a loop integral, therefore there is no UV divergence, but uh, this is a phase space integral, and it gives rise to infrared divergences. So, and uh, as I said, if you add up all possible processes which you cannot distinguish experimentally, then the infrared divergences cancel automatically, um, and the UV divergences cancel by renormalization. But now, uh, as I said, um, you can have um, regular photons, and you have singular photons. And so a photon can now be singular for two reasons, either because of infrared divergences coming only from a phase space integration, or it can be singular because of UV divergences or infrared divergences in a loop. And there are regular photons which have nothing to do with uh, either phase space or loop integrations, and so which are just uh, there in a three-level part of the diagram. Okay, and now you can actually uh, do our table. Let me just show you uh, our characteristic table.
of four different uh, versions of dimensional regularization and dimensional reduction. So we can have CDR and the Toft Feldman scheme, and both are sub variants of uh, dimensional regularization, but they differ in the treatment of infrared divergences. And we can have two variants of dimensional reduction. And uh, one is what we call FDH, four-dimensional helicity scheme, and the other is still called dimensional reduction, but uh, specific um, with specific properties with respect to infrared divergences. And now the table tells you um, what you can do with the singular and the regular photons. So we have singular uh, photons or in general, of course, any kind of vector field. And let me just denote how they are treated. So um, the singular photons, like in loops, vector bosons in loops, they are treated in dimensional regularization, of course, in D dimensions. So they are treated in D dimensions. While in dimensional reduction, they are treated in DS dimensions, or in other words, in four dimensions, but in this quasi four dimensional space, which is a bigger space than the d-dimensional one. Okay, so that is what we have discussed before, and uh, that is not a surprise, but it's uh, just a summary in this form. But now we will see that um, there are also these regular photons, which are not part of any loop or not of any phase space integral. And for them, you actually have the choice uh, whether you want to keep them also in d-dimensions or whether you want to regularize them in general or not. And so here, uh, there are now these different options. Namely, you can keep these regular photons also in D dimensions, or you uh, do not regularize them, which means uh, they are kept in four dimensions. And that is compatible with the prescription by Brighton donor Mison that at the very end of the renormalization procedure, you uh, get rid of all the evanescent stuff. So that is never part of the renormalization process. Therefore, this is compatible with that prescription. So you can keep that in four dimensions. But you don't have to, and so therefore you have these two options. And the difference is that if you now calculate such a Feynman diagram, then from here you get one over epsilon divergences. And uh, if you keep that in D dimensions, then you uh, multiply, let's say, a one over epsilon pole with a d-dimensional expression here, so you get um, uh, something like d or 4 minus 2 epsilon divided by epsilon. So the numerator comes from some algebra of this, and this is a divergence from the loop. So that is some result. But if you uh, keep it in strictly four dimensions, you would have instead this. And now you see that is different. Uh, by an order one term. So it differs by an order one term which does not drop out uh, after renormalization. So it's a, a finite difference. And um, therefore the intermediate uh, steps here differ by finite amounts which are not of the order epsilon but uh, of the order um, one. And uh, Depending on what you want to achieve, uh, this or the other scheme might be easier to treat in practical calculation. And so for dimensional reduction, you have simply the same two options. You can either keep uh, these regular photons in strictly four dimensions, uh, then they are not associated with any evanescent stuff, or you would treat them in fully DS dimensions, then uh, they are treated in the same way as the uh, internal photons. Okay, so maybe that um, just to um, make clear why both schemes have pros and cons. So obviously, uh, this is kind of simpler, and it allows you to have in some parts of your expression immediately explicitly four dimensions. And since uh, this is explicitly four dimensions, you can also use index counting here and, for example, write down an explicit form for your uh, whatever, uh, if it's a vector, um, uh, uh, a polarization vector, or if, if 
uh, that would be connected to a spino, you could write down an explicit expression for the four-dimensional spinos, which is helpful. So that is the advantage of this or that scheme. On the other hand, the advantage of this or that would be that you treat all photons on an equal footing. There is no difference made between any of the photons, so this is CDR stands for conventional dimensional regularization. So this is what you might do completely naively if you don't think about anything. Then you just treat everything equal, and uh, that is of course a very nice thing to do as well. Now let me give another comment. There are some reformulations. also explained in the 2D or not 2D paper. For example, there is FDF. The abbreviation stands for a four-dimensional formulation, or SDF, which stands for a six-dimensional formulation. And these are basically reformulations of the same schemes, uh, as uh, they are most closely related to this FDH scheme. Because if you see, the FDH is maybe, uh, has the closest connection to actual four dimensions because it treats uh, everything as much as possible in four dimensions. So either really in four dimensions or at least in quasi four dimensions, wherever possible. And uh, then the idea uh, of these reformulations is that actually you will see that some of these evanescent objects, uh, so um, evanescent gamma matrices, evanescent p slash uh, contributions, and so on. Um, they appear only in restricted uh, ways in Feynman diagrams. And so actually what one needs is not uh, this explicit construction which uh, exists, but what you need are some algebraic properties and um, uh, you can realize that in certain calculations, let's say one loop or maybe two loop, you only need a subset of all um, possible algebraic relationships. And then you can say, ah, okay, but those algebraic relationships that I really need, I can fulfill by giving an explicit um, construction of these evanescent objects, which is much simpler than the infinite dimensional one. And then for your limited range of calculations, you have a much simpler representation. And for example, uh, this uh, evanescent case slash can be related to the normal gamma 5 matrix because uh, it turns out that uh, it has very similar algebraic properties and therefore you can write down a specific relation which makes use of this idea and then uh, your loop integrals simplify. The difficulty of those um, reformulations is uh, the limited range of applicability and so of course this is uh, exactly ongoing research. Um, to uh, find formulations which uh, make use of such uh, simplifying ideas, but which have, let's say, a larger or even the full range of applicability.